Hello, and thank you for joining us today as we discuss the development of nano suspension formulations for poorly soluble drugs. Uh, today, uh, my name is Ben Reed. I'm the Executive Vice President here at uh, Alta Sciences, uh, CDMO Philadelphia. I'll be joined by Dr. Bruce Frank, who's Vice President here of Operations uh, at this facility also. So some of the objectives that we have for today is to discuss the drug bioavailability cha challenges, potential solutions, wet nano milling, uh, why the equipment that we use and the process that we use for it. So off the sciences, uh, who we are, we are your, your single source, one-stop solution for early phase drug development outsourcing. Uh, we've positioned ourselves as a different kind of CRO, CDMO. Uh, we like to partner with our clients and focus on creating personal and tailored experiences uh, for our clients. Um, and create those successful partnerships uh, that accelerate drug development without increasing risk. So at a glance, we're a mid-size full-service CRL CMO uh, with over 25 years of experience in the industry. We have a strong leadership team. We have sites across US and Canada that we'll see here in a few slides. Uh, and these sites have state-of-the-art facilities. Um, we take a fast and easy drug development process um, approach for a single study or complete program for our clients. We were founded in 1992. Uh, we're about 1,200 employees currently. So some of the core values uh, that we have here at Alta Sciences are integrity, honest uh, and moral principles, quality and excellence, uh, employee development, we provide leadership and really encourage professional development for our employees. Uh, respect, uh, this obviously goes to our employees but to our clients, no matter what size the client is. Uh, and then customer focus. We've built our business um, on really listening to our, our clients and becoming their partners in their development of their API or their dosage solution. So some of the solutions that we do provide here, you can see across the full spectrum from discovery to preclinical and to all phases of clinical. And then finally, uh, post-clinical market studies and commercial manufacturing. Uh, so this CDMO Philadelphia site is represented at the bottom there in purple, the manufacturing and analytical services. We help our clients from preclinical, again, all phases of clinical, um, and then we grow with our clients into commercial production and manufacturing for them. Here's a list of our facilities. Uh, you can start on the left there with Los Angeles is the clinical facility. Um, up top, Seattle is preclinical and bioanalytical, leading into bioanalytical in the wall. The clinical facilities in Montreal and Kansas City, uh, another preclinical facility just up the road from us in Scranton, and then we're in the lower right-hand corner there for manufacturing and analytical services uh, just north of Philadelphia. At this point, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Bruce. Thank you. So thank you for joining us for this webinar today. Um, what we want to focus on here is how to improve bioavailability. A bioavailability is a problem uh, and a factor in development of any drug product, um, but it has become more and more uh, an issue for modern drug development projects due to the insolubility of those drugs. Um, it's been estimated that 40% of marketed drugs um, and 90% of drugs in the drug uh, pipeline, drug development pipeline, um, are poorly water soluble and fall within the BCS or biopharmaceutical classification system, class two or four. As you can see on the chart in the right, these uh, classes of uh, APIs have poor solubility um, and potentially poor um, permeability. BCS class two drugs, which is what we're going to focus on today, um, have uh, poor bioavailability, but that's primarily due to poor solubility and low dissolution rates. And using these drugs uh, effectively in the clinic requires some enhancement of the drug product through formulation. Um, as more and more of these drugs uh, have come into the pipeline, um, we've seen an enhanced number of uh, NDAs for uh, formulations with these enhanced formulation strategies. Um, and in the, in, at the same time, a number of FDA approvals have arisen uh, along with that. So new insoluble drug delivery technologies um, have also been employed for life cycle management of existing drugs and drug products uh, to try to extend patents, improve uh, activity, um, and create value for companies who take that approach. 
So there's a number of common strategies to improve the drug dissolution and bioavailability of poorly soluble drugs. Um, one is the use of co-solvents. It's a simple technique. Um, it's a fairly low cost technique uh, and it's applicable to a, a very wide range of drugs. But the disadvantages often will steer people away from this approach. One is the toxicity of the solvents that are often uh, required. Um, there's risk of drug precipitation. Once the drug is, uh, um, is in vivo and is in an aqueous environment, um, there's a tendency for the solvent to diffuse away, the drug to precipitate, and you lose the advantages that were achieved by the use of the solvent in the first place. And finally, it's limited to liquid formulations. It's not a strategy that can be used for um, oral pills, tablets, capsules, uh, as well as lyophilized products. Another approach is complexation using cyclodextrins. The cyclodextrins improve the chemical stability of the drug by inclusion complexing um, the API uh, and may potentially enhance the drug absorption, which are good things for bioavailability. However, success depends on being able to match both the chemical and geometrical properties of the drug molecule with the available cyclodextrins. Um, occasionally, large amounts of cyclodextrins may be required uh, if the complexation efficiencies are poor. Uh, and this leads to higher costs uh, for a fairly high cost excipient um, for solving these bioavailability problems. Another approach is the creation of solid dispersions. So this can be done by spray drying the uh, API, either solubilized or suspended with another agent that uh, will help encapsulate and stabilize it. Um, this creates fine drug particles without excessive application of energy. Um, the fine particles are readily wetted. Um, there's minimal risk for agglomeration or ag aggregation. Uh, a wide range of hydrophilic polymers are available as drug carriers. So this is a very um, highly used approach for increasing bioavailability. But again, there are some disadvantages. For example, the preparation method is difficult to scale up. There are not very many um, sites that have availability of, for example, commercial scale um, spray drying. Um, another disadvantage is that amorphous drug forms are created, um, which are physically unstable and can convert to the crystalline form during storage. This can change the stability, change the bioavailability, and change the uh, shelf life uh, available to these um, formulations. Another approach that's in the news a lot today with the COVID vaccines is lipid formulations. Uh, these exploit the innate lipid digestion mechanisms of the body, which enhance the drug bioavailability. Um, these emulsifiable lipid formulations further enhance lipid digestion and therefore drug availability. Uh, there's a diversity of lipid excipients that allow the formulator to have a lot of flexibility in developing these formulations. And there's lower risk of drug precipitation in vivo because these particles tend to stay together uh, in the aqueous environments uh, due to the stability uh, applied by the lipids. Again, disadvantages can be cost. Cost can become a factor as there's often two, three, and sometimes as many as four different lipids involved in the, form, in the formulations. High drug loading can be difficult to achieve, increasing the cost uh, and sometimes uh, eliminating the usefulness of these formulations. And then finally, quality control of the lipid-based formulations is complex, having to um, characterize not only the API and its stability, but the lipids and their chemical and physical stability as well. So where do we start? Well, as we showed uh, in the previous slides, in the BCS class two drugs, the dissolution step is really the rate determining factor in delivery of those drugs and they're increasing their bioavailability. And then the four current strategies that are, are widely available, but have uh, the, both their pluses and their minuses. We take a different approach. We try to increase the dissolution, the rate of the dissolution step by decreasing the particle size through milling. So I wanna go through some of the benefits of nanomilling why we do it, how it's done, um, and how it's been used by others. So I promise this is the only math that you're gonna see. 
um, the noise Whitney equation. Um, essentially, what this says is that the rate of dissolution is dependent on a number of things we have no control over, such as diffusivity, the thickness of the aqueous boundary layer, that's H, uh, the concentration of the solute that's dissolved, um, and the equilibrium, equilibrium solubility of that API. The one thing that we do have control over is A, which is the surface area available for dissolution. To break it down and eliminate the math, the smaller the particle size, the greater the surface area. The greater the surface area, the faster the rate of dissolution. The faster the rate of dissolution, the faster the drug absorption. As you can see on the right, as the particle size decreases from 10 microns to 1 to 0.1 microns, uh, there is uh, a concomitant increase in the particle size. And even below 1 micron, you see um, uh, an incredibly fast increase in the surface area uh, of those particles and a concomitant increase in the potential dissolution rate. So here's uh, an example of that with phenofibrate on the left. Uh, the as received drug substance, which was in the micron, tens of microns range, um, only has a solubility of about 10% uh, after two hours um, in a uh, standard dissolution bath. However, the nanomill drug, which is now down to hundreds of nanometer size, uh, is 70% dissolved in only about 30 minutes. And so that increase in the dissolution rate translates directly to bioavailability increases for that compound. And in fact, if you look at our BCS squares on the right, I've circled a number of compounds that have benefited uh, from nat wet nanomilling, decreasing their particle size, increasing their surface area, and increasing their bioavailability. Um, so a number of uh, drugs that uh, you may recognize, such as phenofibrate, uh, prepotent, uh, and danazole. So why do we like nanomilling? Well, it's a unit operation where mechanical energy is applied to physically break down coarse particles to finer ones. Um, we like it because it has wide commercial industrial applications. Virtually every drug can be ground to finer particles by uh, adding energy. And that goes for aqueous soluble and non-aqueous soluble compounds. There have been uh, a number of technolo technological advancements that have helped to increase the scale uh, of, of the production and stabilization of ultrafine drug particles, um, thereby increasing the surface area, increasing dissolution rates, and making possible the delivery of compounds that previously um, were considered brick dust and not good development candidates. There's a number of FDA approved nanomill drug products uh, on the market. There's 12 of them here. Um, and uh, what I would like to point out is the variety of dosage forms uh, that this can help. For example, tablets and capsules for, for oral delivery, oral suspensions, but also injectables for intramuscular injection and even IV. So, uh, Nanomilling brings uh, into the realm of possibility um, a number of delivery formats for your drug, depending on what your needs are. So as for the other delivery methods uh, that we talked about earlier, there are issues for decreasing particle size. One is that when you're milling and increasing the larger, uh, increasing the surface area, um, you're also increasing the free energy and decreasing the thermodynamic stability of those particles. Um, there's a promotion of particle agglomer agglomeration. So with the increase in surface area, there's an increase in the possibility of van der Waals and electrostatic interactions to increase the, uh, the agglomeration. Um, the drugs are code milled with additives. Um, these additives are inert, non-toxic pharmaceutical excipients accepted by the FDA that serve as a carrier or a stabilizer of the drug. Um, and these have to be selected carefully in order to come uh, to a final stable formulation. These excipients are hydrophilic and that's in some of their advantage that they confer, confer this hydrophilicity to the hydrophobic drug particle services, uh, enhances their wettability, their solubility and their bioavailability. 
There's a number of examples of these stabilizers uh, that have been used for some very common drugs. Um, and rather than go through all of the adjuvants, I just point this out to show the, uh, the variety that have of uh, excipients that have been investigated to stabilize these particles. So where do we start at Alta Sciences? Well, we like to be focused and fast. We wanna find out quickly if the drug is a good candidate for wet nanomilling. So our approach is to screen very quickly um, with inexpensive equipment, equipment and small amounts of drug, uh, the number of conditions that would be necessary to come to a stable formulation. Um, the process that we use for the screening is easily transferable to scale up. It uses excipients that are grass, generally regarded as safe and acceptable for further development. And the characterization utilizes easily employed methods. Again, focused and fast. So the equipment, uh, it's very simple where we start. It's, it's simply a roller mill, uh, sometimes referred to as a jar mill. Um, this is sufficient to screen multiple stabilizers, um, concentrations of drug and media, the type of milling media, uh, the amount of time that's required. And volumes can be as low as 50 mils and drug amounts required can be as low as one gram uh, and perhaps up to 10 grams for multiple conditions. So how does this work to reduce the particle size? Well, the figure in the bottom right shows a cutaway of the inside of a jar. Um, it's filled with milling media, your drug, a steric stabilizer, and sometimes an electronic stabilizer, electrostatic stabilizer. Um, and the, the jar is rolled on the rollers on the equipment on the top left, and the, me the media falls onto the API after rolling up the walls and crushes the API over and over and over again. So you go from a micronized drug to the left to the nanosized drug to the right. So the milling media, uh, there's two uh, choices here. One is the ceramic grinding media. This is the most commonly used, the high density yttria stabilized zirconia, sometimes referred to as YTZ. This provides a greater impact force. These are very heavy, dense uh, materials, give excellent grinding efficiency. Uh, they're available in very high purity with smooth surface and almost perfect roundness. Um, these are important for reproducibility, that we have the same milling media uh, every time we do a screen or scale up to uh, our production scales. And the smooth surface allows uh, uh, efficient uh, recovery of the nanomill drug. And finally, they have high wear resistance and fracture toughness, so no materials um, from the YTZ media uh, can be found in the final product. There's also a polymeric milling media. Uh, this is a copolymer of styr styrene divenyl benzene that's been cross-linked. It's very tough and non-abrasive, uh, and thereby minimizes the wear on your milling chambers. Uh, it's sterilizable uh, and thermally stable up to 500 degrees in case sterilization is necessary. It's compatible with both oil and water um, as, a, as, the, aqueous, or as the, the continuous media and then environmentally safe and non-porous. And finally, the spherical and narrow particle size distribution gives you reliable, reproducible uh, milling properties uh, for these products. So again, these are the typical stabilizers uh, that are used. Um, as, you can, as you may see, there's uh, small molecules like vitamin E TPGS, which is a steric stabilizer and contains a long peg chain as part of that molecule. There are polymers such as the pleuronics, the, the cellulosics, um, and then uh, charge molecules like sodium deoxycholate to, pr to provide a electrostatic um, stabilization. So why do we need to use the stabilizers? Well, as, as we said before, aggregation is a problem. As the, as the larger molecules are milled to the smaller, uh, smaller particles uh, and the surface area increases, there's uh, a much greater tendency for aggregation, uh, agglomeration, essentially the sticking together of those particles. Um, and it can be to such a degree that you lose all of the um, uh, advantages of the nanomilling um, as these stick together. 
There's also a second process called Ostwald ripening. This is where smaller particles in suspension dissolve and redeposit on the larger particles. Remember that although you have a saturated uh, solution with particles suspended, it's still an active situation where um, drug is dissolving and re, uh, um, re-precipitating um, at during, during both milling and during storage. Um, so Oswald ripening is a, is a serious problem that can happen in the, uh, uh, you know, within hours of the milling and therefore there's some stabilization required for those drug particles. What you would see after milling um, is the particle size uh, will, distribution will start to shift. So the black is an example of where you might be after milling, but within one hour uh, and one day, that particle size distribution has shifted to the right, the particles are getting larger, and that's going to decrease the solubility rate of your formulation. So the next step in developing the screen um, is choosing the drug concentration. Uh, things to consider are what's the final concentration of the drug that you want in your final formulation. Um, higher concentrations may require higher stabilizer concentrations. So the goal may not be to get as high as you can, but get to some uh, level where it's efficient, uh, you have enough concentration to further formulate to your final formulation um, and use a reasonable amount of stabilizer. The amount of stabilizer is important because there it will be uh, an increased need to increase the amount of stabilizer um, during, the, during the milling and may take you above a safe level for um, use of those excipients in a formulation. And finally, high concentrations of drug and stabilizer actually may decrease the milling efficiency by increasing the system viscosity and decreasing the collision energy. The next step is to select the milling media size and concentration. So typically we would start with the YTZ media. Uh, a number of uh, sizes are, are available. We normally start with a 0.5 millimeter or perhaps a one millimeter um, with a loading of about 50%. Um, for very small target particle sizes of say 200 nanometers or less, um, smaller media is required. Um, and so we'll be on the smaller side uh, of the scale available. Then you need to select your stabilizer. So it's important to consider that the expected delivery method when choosing your stabilizers, for example, um, there are few grass stabilizers available for injectables. So really your choices are limited. Um, there are, however, many stabilizers available for orally administered drugs um, and choosing the right formulators, to, uh, the right stabilizers to start with will uh, add to the speed of and the quality of your results. The next is the roller speed. Remember, this is a jar that is spinning. Um, if you spin it too fast, the media and the drug will simply stick through centripetal force to the outside of the uh, the inside surface of the jar and not uh, reduce the particle size very quickly. You want these uh, particles uh, to interact with the media, have the media fall on them. Um, and so you want to have the speed of the jar um, appropriately selected so that this happens. And then finally, you need to monitor the particle size distribution over time. So on the right is a typical time course for reduction of the particle size. Starting at the right is the larger, is the initial distribution. Um, and as time goes on, you would see uh, that particle size distribution shifting to the left. Um, it gets pretty ugly there in the middle as the particle size uh, distribution gets very wide and disorganized. But as you get towards the end of the milling process, uh, it should all come together in a nice bell-shaped curve distribution. So the equipment for this, as we showed before, uh, is a simple roller mill. It's, a f it's good for uh, a few stabilizers and conditions, three or four for a piece of equipment like that. Um, we have a wide choice of volumes and, and types of containers that you can use uh, for on this mill. But you may have uh, more aggressive timelines. 
And instead of a few stabilizers, you might want to look at a slew of stabilizers and conditions. Uh, this is another roller mill, uh, and this can handle maybe nine to 12 different formulations uh, and conditions uh, run in parallel. And finally, if you need a larger volume, larger scale, you simply buy a larger jar. Uh, and these are readily available well as well, essentially using the same equipment as used for the screen. So where do we go from here? Uh, characterization. Uh, the characterization method, uh, there, there are two main characterization methods for this. One is particle size distribution by laser diffraction. Particle sizes uh, that this is good for is anywhere between 10 nanometers and five millimeters. So this can monitor the wide range that um, you'll be measuring over the time course of the milling. It's great for suspensions, emulsions, powders, paste, gels, and creams. Uh, but of course, we're, we're looking at suspensions here. Uh, it's flexible, it's fully automated, um, gives you maximum precision, uh, and it's also uh, compliant for um, the FDA. Gives excellent reproducibility and, and uh, agreement from equipment to equipment. Um, and the measurements are fairly quick in, in, say, one to two minutes. At the bottom left, you can see typical before and after. The green is a typical uh, particle size distribution of, say, a, a um, jet milled material that uh, would come in. Uh, and on the left in the red is the nano milled by, um, particle size distribution. The second approach is uh, by dynamic light scattering. Um, this is best for smaller particles, uh, particles between one nanometer and say one micron, perhaps up to 10. Um, there's simple uh, or no sample preparation for this, uh, can handle the high concentrations that come out of the nano milling, uh, can handle turbid samples that can be measured directly. Uh, the mean size only uh, determination only requires knowledge of the viscosity of the liquid. Um, and then measurements are done uh, even more quickly in less than 60 seconds. So what you wanna look for when you're checking the particle size distribution um, is a general characterization that's often used for, uh, for these type, type of measurements. That's not only the measure of the median, which is we determined, uh, I'll call the D50, but also the D10 and the D90. But the D90 is uh, the particle size where 90% of the particles are below this size. Um, this is particularly important for injectables as uh, anything being injected IV will have a limit on the upper end of the size of the particles that can be injected safely. The other is the 10% as uh, the D10, which is the number of particles uh, that are 10% below this particle size. And again, these give you a general description of the shape of the bell-shaped curve, which can be different for different molecules, different milling times, different stabilizers. And finally, as we mentioned before, you wanna check for aggregation and Oswald ripening. Um, you wanna take your milled material um, with the stabilizers and let it sit uh, and measure the particle size over hours and, and up to a couple of days just to make sure there's a physical stability there before you go forward with any further formulation optimization. You also wanna look at the dissolution rate. So what you're expecting as we saw for phenofibrate was an increase in the dissolution rate. Um, this can be done with uh, standard buffers that are used for dissolution, um, oral fasted fed simulated media um, and other simulated media depending on where the delivery will occur. For example, saliva, vaginal fluid, um, even uh, vitreous humor. So a number of these are available and can be selected specific to um, the delivery mode you're interested in. Simply take those uh, samples as they dissolve on, on a time scale, um, inject them on HPLC and get a dissolution rate as we see on the right. So where do we go next? Well, you're gonna to wanna to scale this up once you've determined what a good formulation uh, stabilizer drug combination is. Um, here at Alta Sciences, we use the Delta Vita. Um, we have the pilot scale Netch Delta Vita 15, 300, uh, which is good for early stage clinical manufacturing, um, as well as any preclinical work. 
and then a net delta V to 600 for larger later stage uh, clinical and commercial scale manufacturing. So just to give you an idea of what these look like, we've done a cutaway of uh, a general um, diagram of these sorts of uh, um, particle um, uh, milling, wet milling instruments. Um, there's essentially on the left, the drug suspension, which is stirred and pumped into uh, the chamber with the milling media. It also contains obviously the drug and the uh, stabilizer. Um, a, a blow up of that, you can show it, it's a spinning um, agitator with pegs that uh, essentially bang the milling media and the drug together. Uh, that's the energy input. And then um, this can be either collected, it can be recycled so that you can do several passes until you get down to the desired particle size. So I guess the message is uh, here is um, you don't have to imagine necessarily what your drug product's gonna look like, um, only what properties you want. Um, leave it to us to outsource, uh, outsource to us um, to do the early phase uh, drug development uh, in cooperation with our preclinical and clinical sites uh, within Alta Sciences. Um, again, a number of sites available across North America our site is here in Harleysville, Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia and in the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical um, arenas uh, in, uh, in New Jersey. And finally, contact us directly. These are four senior um, people, Ben and myself, as well as uh, Sean Conahan and Dennis DiBiagio, if uh, you have any questions or development needs that we can help you with. And now some questions. Uh, if there's any questions from the audience, be happy to answer them. Yes, yeah, so Bruce, it looks like a few questions have come in. Uh, so I'll just read the first couple of questions here and give you an opportunity to respond. Uh, so the first one is, does scaling from a roller mill to high energy media mill like a Delta Vita require much formulation or process optimization? It's actually less than you might expect. Um, Typically the drug loading, uh, the media loading and the stabilizer concentrations um, would be unchanged. Uh, there may be some small tweaks required um, as you go up to a larger scale with uh, um, a particular excipient level. Um, the most dr uh, dramatic change would be uh, determining the milling time. Um, since it's a much higher energy um, method, uh, sometimes those uh, milling times are extremely short, shorter than you might expect. Uh, and there's a danger of over milling, which can actually start to increase the particle size and change the crystalline form of the API. So um, really milling time is the only, um, uh, the only factor that we really need to pay attention to when you move to the higher energy equipment. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Where can we look to confirm that a stabilizer is considered suitable by the FDA? Well, the FDA on their website, um, on their public website, has a um, inactive ingredients database. Essentially, it's a list of all the drugs um, that have been marketed with all of their excipients, uh, and even in many cases, the levels, the amounts of those excipients that are in those products. Um, that is the, the primary place that we look to um, select among the many excipients and stabilizers that are available. Uh, it will also tell you, you know, whether those have been used as oral, injectable, topical, um, or, or, or say um, mucosal uh, stabilizers or, or excipients. So that's, that's where you would wanna look first. If you go on the FDA inactive ingredients uh, website, I'm sorry, the FDA website and, and search for their inactive ingredients database, uh, it'll pop right up. Wonderful. Uh, how can the nano suspensions be further processed for other dosage forms? Well, there's, there's a number of different ways. Um, typically you're milling at very high concentration. So they're, they're often diluted um, for oral suspensions or, or eye drops. Um, they can be lyophilized. That uh, can add additional stability, physical and chemical stability to those formulations. Um, they can be absorbed onto um, a, 
uh, another particle like a silica particle um, to help with the delivery and then incorporate it perhaps into an oral uh, solid dosage form. Um, they can be spray dried. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that they can be further processed um, and, uh, and developed into a final formulation. Okay. So we'll just field two more questions here. So uh, can potent compounds be nanomilled at Alta Sciences? Uh, they can. Uh, we have set ourselves up to handle um, potent compounds in another number of formats and with a number of processes, including nanomilling. So um, yes, ab absolutely, that's, an avail that's available here at Alta Sciences. Okay, and final one we'll take right now is, how small can nanomilling take an API down? Well, that, that's a great question. That, that's one that uh, we're asked very often. And uh, the, the answer is it depends on the API itself. Um, the, the friability, fracturability of those API crystals um, which can depend on the crystalline form um, as well as uh, other salt forms of those drugs. Um, it's the, the, the mostly the determining factor. Um, given that particles can be nanomilled and have been nanomilled to uh, generally easily between 100 and 200 nanometers and sometimes even lower. Uh, well, I've seen uh, down to say 50 nanometers uh, for certain drugs. Okay. Great. So I think that's all the time that we have right now for questions, but as Bruce said, please feel free to reach out to any one of us in this presentation uh, to continue to ask questions um, about all sciences or nano milling as a whole. Uh, we'd like to uh, say thank you one more time for joining us today and, and wish everybody a good rest of their day. Thank you. Bye-bye.